Today is the second Sunday in Advent. Last Sunday, the first Sunday, uh, we talked about hope as we lit uh, the Advent wreath, the candles on the Advent wreath. And then today, we are going to light magically both, which represent hope and peace. All right. So this morning, we light the Advent candle representing peace. His birth here, remember, we talked about incarnation, and we're going to talk about this Christmas Eve big time. His, his birth here, the incarnation, brings peace. Well, it brings all these things, hope, joy, peace, and love, but it particularly brings peace because he is, in the Old Testament, called the Prince of Peace from the prophet Isaiah. I want you to hear this. Peace is not where, we, where we're at, but it's who is with us where we're at. I hope that made sense. Is it not necessarily where we're at in life, but it's about who is with us where we're at in our life. And Jesus is with us. He is the Prince of Peace. This really can be said about all these things, hope, joy, peace, and love. It's not necessarily what's going on in our life, the circumstances that give us those things, but it's Jesus that brings those things to our lives in the midst of it. Peace is not the absence of trouble, but it's the presence of 
of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. So here's what I want you to do just for a second is uh, we did this last time. I want you to ask in your mind, just think about this, where in your life do you need the Prince of Peace this Christmas? Just think about it for a second. Where in your life do you need the Prince of Peace this Christmas? Today we're going to be in Matthew. So if you turn to the Gospel of Matthew in your Bibles, the Scripture will be on screen today. We're going to start Matthew 1. I get asked a lot of times by people, um, also get your binoculars out too. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Sorry about that. I get asked a lot by a lot of people, okay, I want to start reading my Bible. Where do I start? All right? That's a big question. And I often tell people this is where to start in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the first book in the New Testament. It's one of the Gospels, which is an account of Jesus' life here on earth. And it's an account from an apostle, someone who walked with Jesus while he was here on earth. So it's it's also a reliable book. Matthew is a reliable book. It was one of the most um, heavily circulated in the early church uh, books or Gospels. And so it's a reliable book uh, among uh, Christians. So this is usually where I tell people, Uh, if they want to start reading the Bible, to start with the Gospel of Matthew. Now, here's the problem. Uh, I also, and I I take accountability for this, when I tell people this, I also tell them, start with Matthew, but skip the genealogy. That's terrible. I, 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 I admit to it, and I'm sorry, and I should not do that. But I don't think I'm alone here because I think if I told you to start with Matthew, the gospel, you would probably skip the genealogy. All right? And and we would skip over it. And in fact, in in the Bible, there's a lot of places where there's genealogy and we skip through it. We just glaze over it. And and this this is wrong. Because one of the reasons the book of Matthew was placed as the first book in the New Testament is genealogy. It serves as a, as a bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The New Testament begins with genealogy, Jesus' genealogy. Now listen, for 400 years, for 400 years prior to Matthew, God has been silence, his, silent. His silence is, is broken with the events that we celebrate at Christmas. The Old Testament ends with no resolve. You know what that means? I mean, there's no resolve at the end of the Old Testament. And then suddenly we turn the page 400 years to the New Testament, to Matthew, and the telling of these events begin with genealogy. The resolve begins with genealogy. All of the New Testament begins with this. And in those days, uh, this was a priority for an author and for the reader. They would have wanted to see this. They they wouldn't have skimmed over it or skipped it. This would have been vital information for them to connect God's promise from Abraham to David to Jesus Messiah that we celebrate at Christmas. This would have been, this is vital information. So we're going to read it. We're not going to glaze over it. And you're going to chuckle as I I mispronounce names. And uh, we're going to see names that we I know of in their stories, okay? So we're going to do our, we're going to read through this. Matthew 1, 1 through 17, this is gene- genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior. This is a rec, rec- excuse me, it's verse 1. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, who was a mother, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, the prostitute. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. We remember the story of Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. 
Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam was the father of Abijah. Abijah was the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat. I was going to insert a funny joke there, jumping Jehoshaphat, but I don't think that connects with the Bible. Jehoshaphat was the father of Jehoram. Jehoram was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham was the father of Ahaz. Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. Josiah, the father of Jehoiakim and his brothers, born at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the Babylonian exile, Jehoiakim was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abedad. Abedad was the father of Eliakim. Eli you can, did y'all notice a name change kind of there? I didn't notice that until I was reading that aloud, that there was uh, something happened at the Babylonian exile where the sound of the names changed. I'm going to research that. Um, Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok the father of Akim. Akim the father of Eliad. Eliad the father of Eleazar. Eleazar the father of Madhan. Madhan was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph. Interesting thing here. It's been father to son, father to son. And now look at this. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called Messiah. All those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David. That's what the Jews would want to see connected. Abraham to Jer J uh, David, 14 from David to a Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. Okay, let's talk for a second. Genealogies. My wife is big on genealogies. She has the Ancestors.com, Ancestry.com. Maybe some of you got um, I do too because she has made me have it and look up my ancestors, the subscription. And she has traced her family lineage back to probably the Garden of Eden. Um, <laughs> I have, uh, and, and during this, every, they got little leaves that pop up when, you, when something new happens in Ancestry.com. And so every time a little leaf pops up for her, I have the honor and privilege of listening to a story about one of her ancestors. God bless her. She's working in the kids' ministry today. <laughs> and she discovers something new about one of her ancestors. But as we read through the ancestry, the ancestors of Jesus, and we see these names, each person in Jesus' genealogy has a story, right? Not just a name. It has a story. And some of them we know, right? We feel as we read their name, we know their story from the Old Testament, so Matthew's birth narrative begins with genealogy, not the most exciting way to begin. In fact, again, we tend to skip over the scripture altogether. But then ancestry was important to Matthew, and it should be to us. This is why he leads with it in the New Testament. Matthew was a tax collector, remember? He had an in interesting interest in accounting. And in his line of work, uh, keeping an account was important. This is something I read I want to share with you. As a tax collector, tax collector, Matthew possessed a skill that makes his writing all the more exciting for Christians. Tax collectors were expected to be able to write in a form of shorthand, which essentially meant that Matthew could record a person's word as they spoke, word for word. This ability means that the words of Matthew are not only inspired by the Holy Spirit, but should represent an actual transcript of some of Christ's sermons. For example, the Sermon on the Mount, as recorded in chapters 5 through 7, is almost certainly a perfect recording of the great message. Isn't that awesome? Matthew's purpose for, the, for beginning with Jesus' gene genealogy is to strike a chord with the Jews, connecting Jesus with important names and their stories throughout Jewish history, the major connections being Abraham and David, which is highlighted at the beginning and the end of this genealogy. And Matthew knew that genealogies were important to all, Jew, to all Jews, and they kept extensive genealogies themselves. They did this for two reasons, to establish a person's legitimacy and then inheritance rights. That's why they kept uh, 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 their genealogies. About finish it. So Matthew, the Jewish tax collector, turned apostle of Christ, uses the genealogy to establish Jesus' legitimacy and inheritance, beginning with Father Abraham 
and David. If you notice, there are also five women listed in this genealogy. And this would, have, this would have been unusual to include women in those days. What makes it even more unusual is that some of these women, which I mentioned one, had questionable character, and two of them were Gentiles. It is Jesus' genealogy that begins Matthew that proves he is the king of the Jews, king of the world, king for all people. Genealogy is important. So, We need to keep that in mind as we read Matthew and not glaze over genealogy, especially this time of the year. The Bible is God's big story, and this genealogy is the big reveal of God's hero in the story, which is Jesus. We turn from Old Testament to New Testament, 400 years of silence. Matthew starts with genealogy, and there's a big reveal of the hero and how he's connected to the Old Testament. So that's a little bit about genealogy. Let's talk about Joseph. We're going to talk about three things, genealogy, Joseph, and wise men, okay? So let's talk about Joseph for a minute. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. It's going to be familiar to you. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin, this is the, the message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel. We sang about this. God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. So Matthew's birth narrative focuses on genealogy, and then it focuses on Joseph. And I feel like sometimes we overlook Joseph, and, or, or, or we feel sorry for Joseph in the birth narrative, in the story of Jesus, like he's an innocent bystander in what God is doing through Mary. And so let's talk about Joseph for a little bit. We don't know a lot about him. Honestly, uh, we know a few things. We know his genealogy. Uh, he's a descendant of David. We know that he is from Nazareth. We know he was a carpenter. We know he was engaged to Mary. We know he was the adoptive father of Jesus. We know no words from him biblically. No words spoken or quoted. We know that he was probably dead before Jesus' earthly ministry began because there's no mention of him in the Gospels, other than the birth. We don't know a lot about Joseph, but he shows us a lot about himself in this account. And those two things he shows us is that he is righteous and he is obedient. Righteous and obedient. It says that Joseph was righteous. He, he was going to do the right thing. He was going to do the right thing, and he was going to break the engagement quietly. He was righteous, but he was hurt. He was embarrassed. He was angry. Being righteous doesn't mean you don't, you, you don't feel anything. But what it does, it, it means that you do the right thing when you're feeling the feelings. Okay? So he was, he was righteous, and he was hurt and angry and embarrassed, but yet he was still going to do the right thing and break the engagement quietly. And then he was visited in a dream by an angel. And with that, doing the right thing became the obedient thing because the angel said, do this pretty clearly. And so he did. And he was obedient. And because of his righteousness and because of his obedience, Joseph names Jesus, Jesus. Now, the name was given to him. But he got to give it away. He got to name Jesus, Jesus. 
Also, his genealogy is in a, in a gospel of the Messiah. Jesus is king through Joseph's genealogy. Mary carries and births the king. The miracle happens through Mary, but Joseph's genealogy connects the king. Joseph was righteous and he was obedient. Matthew's birth account also talks about the wise men. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. I know you think that, um, like many of our nativity scenes show, that the wise men were there simultaneously that night, right? Let's read Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is this Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem and Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem, search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and it stopped over the place where the child was, and when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child was with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they offered, opened the treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. If the focus of Matthew is on Jesus as king, then of course he would highlight visitors fit for a king, which the wise men were, or magi. And he would also focus on gifts fit for a king, which they brought. They came from the east, so this is, gonna, this is now a worldwide thing. This is not just an Israel thing. This is a worldwide thing deal. And I've heard it speculated that they were um, descendants of Jews that were uh, dispersed with Daniel during that dispersion, and that they knew Jewish prophecy. The wise men wouldn't have arrived until probably, you heard the word house used, uh, hadn't arrived until probably two years after Jesus' birth. The Bible never says that there were three of them, just that they brought three gifts. There could have been three, there could have been more, but there were three gifts that were brought. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These gifts that they brought are significant, all right? They didn't just pick them up at the Dollar General in the corner. I'm sure there was a Dollar General there. There had to be a Dollar General there somewhere. They didn't just pick up something on their way at the Dollar General. These were significant gifts for a king. So listen to this. Gold symbolizes his divinity. Emmanuel, God with us. It, it is valuable and, and probably financed their flee to Egypt. I read this one year and it just amazed me. They had to flee to Egypt and the gold that the, the, the uh, wise men brought probably financed them fleeing uh, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus to Egypt. Frankincense symbolizes his willingness to become a sacrifice. Frankincense is a resin that comes from a tree, kind of like a sap. And when it is burnt, it is highly fragrant. So it was used in worship as an offering to God. Myrrh. Myrrh symbolizes the great suffering that Jesus would go through as a man, ultimately giving his life for us. Myrrh also comes from a tree but was a spice used for embalming. The myrrh spice was often added to wine, create, creating a drink called gall. And if you remember, this is the drink given to Jesus upon the cross. It was given to ease the suffering, and Jesus tasted it, realized that it, what it was, and would not drink it. He rejected it because it would numb the suffering 
Jesus wanted to completely fulfill his place as our substitute. The, there's a song called How Many Kings by Down Here. You might have heard it playing before the service. And it describes the gifts like this. Gold for his honor, frankincense for his pleasure, and myrrh for the cross that he will suffer. Guests fit for a king bringing gifts fit for a king. When they left, as we know, they saw right through Herod's annex. And when they left, they didn't just take a different physical route to avoid Herod, but they, they returned to where they came from, having experienced something life-changing. And it's said that the wise men were the first missionaries for Jesus Christ in the east where they traveled to and traveled from. So here there are two kings, Herod and Jesus, with two very different kingdoms. That lives intersect, but because of three kings, quote, unquote, from a, from a very different kingdom. So Matthew, as you read the Gospels, he's going to focus on genealogy. Read it again. He's going to focus on um, Joseph, the father, the stepfather. And he's going to focus on wise men. As you read this with your families, now you have a little bit more background information that you can share with them. I hope you are doing that this Christmas reading the story of Jesus' birth. Next week, we will discuss the Gospel of Luke, which focuses on shepherds and Mary, right? The star. Will you bow in prayer with me this morning? <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it teaches us Father God, how there is so much more there that we just overlook. And God, may this Christmas we not do that. May we seek to grow and learn more about you and your son, Jesus. So, Father God, that we can share with others that the Messiah has come. And the Messiah will come again. So, Father God, I pray that our focus this year, more than any other year, is to know and understand and grow in your word and the story of your son's birth. May this be the focus of our celebration. Jesus Messiah, God with us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.